to be talking about, uh, so, so far in this lecture series, we've talked about a pretty wide variety of things. Uh, we've talked about, uh, well, we've talked about Portuguese and Portugal colonization and Africa. And then we talked these last couple times, we talked about some pretty broad kind of uh, archaeology in New Mexico, and then some variety of uh, projects that I'd worked on through my career with the state of New Mexico. Uh, today, we're going to focus in on what's been the passion of the last decade of my career, uh, which is the, the Jemez region. And I say decade of my career because I actually, my interest in the Jemez region actually goes back uh, to 2008, uh, when I went back to graduate school at the University of New Mexico. As the first graduate in the public archaeology program, the area where I chose to work for my master's was in, in, in the Jemez region, or the, the area that is known archaeologically as Jemez province. And so we're going to talk about that area today. So I'm not going to talk specifically about Jemez historic site today. Um, normally, I would put in a plug here that if you'd like to learn how Jemez historic site fits within this broader context, you should visit it. However, right now, you should not visit Jemez historic site as we are currently closed due to COVID-19. Hopefully, you'll come back to Jemez sooner rather than later, and you'll get to explore the history of Jemez province through the eyes of Jemez historic site. But for today, we're going to talk primarily about broad strokes for the region. And some of these slides may look familiar to you because they've shown up at past PowerPoints, but we're going to use them in quite different ways today. Um, so let's 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 start out and let's see where we get to. This is also an older presentation, so you can see how I've evolved in presentations. Um, all of these presentations I've been doing for the, these talks have been all throughout my career. This is one I did in 2013 uh, when I first started at Hamas Historic Site. So what is uh, to just start with, and this is an old map I used in my report that I've stuck at the slide here. Uh, what is Jemez province? Well, Jemez province to the Spanish wasn't really the whole Jemez Mountains. Um, in, in fact, the Jemez Mountains as a whole has many different cultural histories. Uh, the Pajarito Plateau, for example, is a part of the Jemez Mountains. The Chama River Valley, uh, the area, those are both areas, the Pajarito Plateau and the Chama River Valley are both areas uh, occupied by 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 Tewa speaking peoples, those are, are parts of the Jemez Mountains, but they had a very different people in them. There's also a region up in the the northwest portion of the Jemez Mountains. If you look at this map here. Um, that, that was an area that's often referred to as the Guyana, and we'll be talking a little bit about the Guyana in this lecture as they relate to the people in Jemez Province. But the Guyana culture really didn't extend into Jemez Province. So what is when we say Jemez province, what are we talking about? We're talking about the area from about Redondo Peak in the Valles Caldera, south to San Ysidro, or the confluence of the Rio Jemez and Rio Salado. Obviously, San Ysidro didn't exist when Jemez province was defined. And then from about Peralta Canyon in the east uh, to about one mile west of the, the Guadalupe Tunnel. Uh, and, and you can kind of see that kind of uh, strange kind of semicircular provincial area there. You'll notice that it includes technically parts of Z, what we would call Zia Pueblo today. Um, that doesn't mean Zia Pueblo or Jemez people. It just means that, that, that it oftentimes when the Spanish were referring to the area, they often included Zia in that discussion. Uh, but we won't be talking necessarily about the Kara speaking Zia today, uh, but rather the Toa speaking Jemez people. Uh, also, um, give some ideas as to periods of human occupation. What I'm gonna use for this talk, this classification system is used throughout the Northern Rio Grande, usually in the Al from areas such as the Albuquerque area, north to Taos, um, from the Jemez Mountains east to, to the, the Pecos area. It's, it's, it's a classification system that's used for most Rio Grande Pueblo peoples. Um, and, and there's a lot of regional variabilities here. So if you see what's highlighted in, 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 or, or bolded, you'll, you'll see that next to the coalition, the classic in the Spanish colonial period, we have the Vallecitos, Jemez, and Walatoa phases, which have slightly different dates. I'm not gonna talk about those today, but in two weeks, those are gonna become very important because those phases, uh, uh, specifically for the Jemez Mountains, are very important when you're talking about agriculture. 
we'll point out some of the general trends in agriculture today, but we'll really be going into these phases and what makes these phases so remarkably different um, uh, later on. You'll also notice that the Jemez phase actually includes the both the classic period of New Mexico history and the first hundred years of the Spanish colonial period, um, which in, in Jemez terms, that, that includes the transitions of the arrival of missionaries and even the Pueblo Revolt are all considered a uh, part of the, the localized Jemez phase. And there's a reason for that. Th those phases are tied to agriculture and pottery production for the most part. Um, okay, next slide. So Paleo-Indian period, what is the Paleo-Indian period? Well, we've talked about this during our hunting in archeology span uh, uh, perspective of, an archeological perspective of hunting in New Mexico. Uh, it's an area where they were, it was a time period in which they were pursuing large game. The dates for these different phases, by the way, of Clovis, Folsom, and Plano are really dependent upon who you ask, but uh, you, can, you can modify those slightly as research becomes more abundant. But pretty much they're um, hunters and gatherers pursuing large game. They're focused on hunting large game. They use large projectile points. And those projectile points look like the, some of those examples you see there. Um, uh, a very interesting time in New Mexico history. There is not a lot of Paleo-Indian archaeology done in the Jemez province proper. So while we have lots of nearby Paleo-Indian sites, both in, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, west of Santa Fe on the Caja del Rio, or uh, west of Albuquerque uh, uh, around the volcanoes, there is no formal Paleo-Indian finds, per se, in the mountains. It's very likely that they were in the Jemez Mountains. We just haven't found any what we consider um, ideal Paleo-Indian archaeological sites. And interestingly enough, as we'll get into, um, you know, uh, were they using obsidian? Paleo-Indian peoples in general really didn't like to use obsidian. It was too brittle. Um, it's, it's, it's not an ideal resource for the types of, of activities they're doing. So the Jemez Mountains may not have been as attractive to mainly paleo Indian people. It's not to say they didn't go there, but uh, we see less evidence of it than we do elsewhere in the state of New Mexico. Uh, the archaic period is, is the next time period we often talk about. It's the time period in which agriculture was adopted. Um, in, in northwestern New Mexico, we use the Orshara tradition, which I will be going into a lot more detail in the next two weeks, uh, the, the next lecture. Uh, but for, for, for now, it's all tied into different types of projectile points. And the big transition from the archaic, the paleo Indian to the archaic, and some people debate this, is a shift from primarily focused on a culture uh, that's focused on hunting large game uh, to a culture that's really interested in focusing primarily on plant resources. Now, obviously, both groups did both, um, but it's it, it certainly... We think of the archaic period, that's what we to do. It's also more regional. And the Oshara tradition is really a four corners kind of um, Rio Puerco kind of area, which is adjacent somewhat to the, the Jemez Valley um, or Jemez province, but, but, but slightly off. This is not necessarily the class, a good classification system for the Jemez Mountains, but we certainly see uh, representat representations of all these traditions in the Jemez Mountains. And of course, the most famous archaic site in the Jemez Mountains is Jemez Cave. Um, inter interestingly enough, it's one of the earliest agricultural sites in the American Southwest. Um, and, and I don't mean that in, in terms of Jemez province, I mean in the entire American Southwest, it's one of the earliest agricultural sites. Uh, does that mean it was one of the first places people farmed? No. What it means is the conditions were right in Jemez Cave for the preservation of corn and pumpkin seed. So we have good evidence of people doing cultivation very early on in the Jemez Mountains. It is, it's, it's located right in the heart of Jemez province. In fact, it's a mile north of Jemez historic site right along the road. Um, and it has intermittent occupation from at least 8200 to, to 1700, probably much, much earlier than that. Um, we, uh, the, the dates um, uh, certainly can maybe we go back as far as 1000 BC. There's some debate on some of those early dates, but it's literally a cave overlooking the Jemez River. Not only did it have the, these agricultural intimate, you know, uh, materials, the, 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 these corns and pumpkins, it also had a, a, a rich uh, material culture record, which included yucca fiber basketry and turkey feather blankets. Uh, in fact, uh, interestingly enough, and I've told this story multiple times, but it's worth repeating here, especially since many of these people, many of the people watching this, probably have not heard me say this before. 
if, if you go through a long history, a lot of, sometimes people ask me, well, what, what, there used to be a baby in the palace of the governors uh, on display, a dead infant uh, wrapped in a turkey feather blanket. Um, that infant came from Hamas Cave and that turkey feather blanket that, that was wrapped in that infant is um, been the model for making replicating all turkey feather blankets in the American Southwest. So when people replicate turkey feather blankets today, such as this picture you see on the right-hand side of Eric working on a, a turkey feather blanket at the Office of Archaeological Studies, um, they're all modeled based upon what came out of the cave. Now, now fortunately, in this story, uh, Museum of New Mexico, yes, it sounds horrible. Did we, we, did we in the past have uh, human remains on display at the Palace of the Governors? We absolutely did. That infant has been repatriated to Jemez Pueblo and is reburied. Uh, and repatriated and is, uh, you know, obviously, even if you see the cave today, please stay out of it. It's an active archaeological site and there's restrictions on visiting it for a reason. Developmental period. Now, this is where we're going to get into the, this kind of um, Jemez people in, in Jemez province per se. Uh, in the northern Rio Grande, it's actually broken up into two phases. During this time period, we see the transition from the atlatl to the bow. So they, they go from a spear thrower or, or javelin chucker, dart chucker, uh, to a, a, a stringed um, weapon that shoots an arrow. They also develop pottery, and it's broken into two phases, uh, early and late. It's not very, um, they, they're not substantial or anything. In fact, what they really mean is uh, before Chaco and after Chaco. Um, so uh, the Northern Rio Grande, uh, before the emergence of Chaco further west, uh, was kind of going on its own tra trajectory. But after Chaco, a lot of Chaco and influences, contact is certainly coming into the Rio Grande. It's influencing things going on there, uh, which is why we see it broken up into those two phases. Just to give a, a brief review, we say Pueblo culture groups or Pueblo. A Pueblo is a problematic term, as most of you probably already know. It's a Spanish term meaning villager. But in archaeology, there, are, if, if we look at using the term Pueblo simply from an archaeological perspective, there's three large groups uh, of, of Pueblo peoples, and, and some peoples might 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 kick it out to a couple more peoples, depending upon. Uh, how you, you view the American uh, Southwest. There's some peoples in Western Arizona that could be potentially viewed as, as, as Pueblo peoples. But uh, for this lecture, uh, we, we don't necessarily need to focus on those. The three big groups are the Anasazi, which are the people of the Four Corners, the Ho'okam, those are the people of the, the Tucson and Phoenix area, and, and the Mogollon, the, the Mogollon being a people's that were in eastern Arizona, southern New Mexico, but but most of Mogollon culture was actually in in what is now present day modern Mexico. Uh, in fact, we, we you know we, we take great pride in, in Mimbris culture and, and some of the other uh, Mogollon cultures, but the, the really impressive, really uh, out amazing Mogollon kind of culture sites are actually located in, in, in modern day Mexico, and you can go to those. Those include things like uh, Pakine. Uh, so you have these three big cultures. Um, for, for the developmental period, and all these things are established by the developmental period. In the, in the developmental period, uh, the Jemez Mountains is going pretty strong. There aren't a lot of people living there. In fact, Jemez Cave probably never had more than a couple families at most living in it. Uh, but people in the developmental period start to come into the Jemez Mountains to obtain one important thing. You can see it there. It's lying all over the ground. Um, what what you see is obsidian, uh, artifact quality obsidian. Um, the Jemez Mountains actually has several different locations that produce this material. But of course, the the most impressive to most of you is is is, is probably um, Cerro del Medio, which is in the Valles Caldera. Um, in 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 as Chaco gets going, we start seeing obsidian objects in the Chaco Canyon region. Those have all been sourced, and a lot of them come from the Redondo Creek area uh, in the Jemez Mountains. So we know that the people in Chaco had access either through trade networks or through actually going into the Jemez Mountains themselves and acquiring this material. Jemez obsidian is found throughout, by the developmental period, is found throughout the American Southwest and, and points even further on. So there are people move, coming and going through the Jemez Mountains. But during this time period, the Jemez people, uh, the Toa-speaking peoples that we know today, 
weren't really in those mountains at that time. Um, there's a debate as to where, where the hame has come from. We'll get into that uh, in, in, a, in a couple slides. But in the kind of the northwest corner, the western portion of the Haymaz Mountains during this, this later developmental period, another culture group really kind of fluoresces during this period, and that's the Largo Gaina culture. And the pictures you see there, the, the one on the left is Rattlesnake Ridge, and the one on the right is Nogales Cliff House. And you can visit both those sites. Those are on federal land today. Um, Largo Gaina culture um, went strong from about 1050 to 1275. So really that last part of the developmental period in, in, into the, the coalition. The Gaina lived in kind of dispersed settlements, high atop ridges, um, and they practice agriculture and really an environment that's marginal, um, which is gonna become a theme uh, of, of the later Jemez people. Uh, they, they live on these kind of like hogbacks, these really narrow ridges and, um, in addition to doing some agriculture in these areas, and in Largo Gaina, if, if you want to put yourself into kind of a mental footnote for yourself, it's it's north of Cuba. Most of it's most of the cultural expression, though there are some sites right in the Cuba area. Most of it's that area just north of Cuba, uh, where these sites are actually coming from. Um, they're doing farming, but they're also relying a lot on, on on wild plants and animals to supplement agricultural yields. And, and the fascinating thing about the, the Gaina culture is that most people say, well, there's very limited evidence of trade and very clear evidence of violence amongst them, which has made them a um, favorite for people studying uh, indigenous warfare in the American Southwest. Were they really that violent? Uh, most of the violence um, amongst the Largo Gaina appears to happen kind of at the, the that most of the evidence for violence tends to happen at the, the later point of that, that cultural range. At the same time, we see uh, violence in the American Southwest really erupting everywhere. So uh, to some extent, and there is some debate as whether the violence was amongst the Gaina themselves or it was outsiders coming in committing atrocities against the Gaina. And we, we really don't have any um, there's a lot of theories put out there, but I, I wouldn't necessarily take any of those and say, oh, that's definitely the response or that's, I don't think people really know, uh, but it's always good to keep uh, perspective on things. Yes, there was violence, but it, during the time frame when the, this violence occurs amongst the Largo Guyana, there's violence everywhere in the American South. That's, this is the great upheaval in migration of peoples. Uh, that period is known as the coalition period in the Northern Rio Grande. Um, in the coalition period, the Northern Rio Grande transfers from a pit house structure to Pueblo style villages. It's really late in the sequence. Most places in the four corners amongst the Anasazi, they've been living in above ground villages for hundreds of years at this point. But above ground villages don't really come into the Rio Grande until about 1200 AD. And um, the pit house is maintained as a ceremonial structure, as a kiva. And the populations of this time period, the Northern Rio Grande, uh, really hits a boom in populations. Uh, some people point that this is in C2 population increase, but a lot of it's also probably the result of migration and large interconnected trade routes, which, which networks, which are connecting not only the Northern Rio Grande, uh, at this point, Chaco is no longer going, but the Mesa Verde region and other areas, such as the Toata, which you don't hear as much about, uh, and, and other regions uh, in the Four Corners, and, and, and certainly in the, the Zuni area as well. There's huge connections between the people here and the people's further west. And so, of course, those peoples are coming in, and we can see that in these migration patterns. So the first big migration kind of kicks off the coalition. That's the abandonment of Chaco. And then after that, we're, we're going to get a, uh, a second migration. And there's actually more migrations than this, but these are just two good examples. Uh, Chaco, because these are places you've probably heard of, Chaco Canyon migration, they shoot out all over the place. Some of them go into the Rio Grande and then Mesa Verde migration, they shoot out all over the place. These two big booms really transform Pueblo society in the Northern Rio Grande and in the Jemez province. And it's during this time period, this coalition time period that we see the arrival of peoples that we would call Jemez today. There is large numbers of peoples entering into Jemez province around 1200 AD. Those peoples are, are, are uh, th this, this correlates with a, uh, a pottery style known as Biocitos, black on white. It's kind of like a precursor to Jemez, black on white. 
and it's often referred to locally as the Viacitos period. We have strong archaeal or uh, strong strong is a, a strong word. We have some archaeological evidence that at least several large villages were at least established during this time. Uh, those might have included Patoqua, Pajunqua, Bolotsakwa, Babakwa, To. I, I'm not going to pronounce all those words. I'm sorry. Nanashagi, Wajab, Jamka. Hey, this is probably an opportunity for uh, uh, Brenda or Marlin to correct me on my Toa language. The, the image you're looking at is the archaeological remains of Pajunqua, uh, which, which, if you'll notice, it doesn't look. Uh, it's hard to tell there's even a Pueblo there. The only thing you can see is that the trees aren't growing in several places. And interestingly enough, Pajunqua was actually the only, is one of the only adobe Pueblos in the Jemez Mountains. And um, so what you're seeing there is the mounds, they're more like Coronado's mounds actually than, than like uh, the mounds at Gisela. Um And you can see that by, by you know, it, it's just puddled adobe that's melted down and grass has grown on top of it. The trees don't like to grow on the, the adobe, but, but, it, but the grass grows just fine. Uh, they don't have the weeds that we get at Coronado a lot of the times because it's a forested environment. Um, so where do they come from? Where, where, where do these Hamas show up from? Well, archaeologists have two basic theories. One is uh, known as the Rio Grande hypothesis. This is the idea that these, these Viacitos people migrate up, you know, we talked about uh, in situ population growth along the northern Rio Grande. Well, one philosophy is that population grows and they just follow the Jemez River up into the mountains and they eventually get on the Viacitos River in, their, in the Guadalupe River and they just start to populate the area. And, and the main argument for this is, is this gradual migration is the fact that Viacitos black on white looks like Santa Fe black on white. It looks like the pottery that was being made in the northern Rio Grande um, during that, that late developmental phase in, in, in coalition phase, in early coalition phase. So these, the, there is a, um, there, there's a, there's a potential link there that, 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 that perhaps these are coalition peoples coming in from the, the, the greater Rio Grande area. Interestingly enough, Santa Fe Black and White, and I know it's called Santa Fe Black and White, it was actually produced over a very large area, not just in the Santa Fe area. These are not uh, Santa Fe migrants. The other one is um, another hypothesis that's been put forward. And um, the, the first one was is really that the champion of it been Michael Elliott, who's one of the greatest archaeologists in the Jemez Mountains, uh, bar none. Um, the, the other hypothesis, which is much old, older, is from Paul Ryder. Uh, he's the one who wrote up the excavations at Unshagi, as well as some work at, at Kisawa. And, and, and he pretty much noticed that pretty much at exactly the same time the Gaina seemed to leave their, their, their lands, the Jemez appear to show up in Jemez province. Moreover, there's, there's uh, striking um, similarities between the structures um, that you find at places like Rattlesnake Ridge. There, there's a certain layout to those rooms um, that is atypical. Like other Pueblo peoples don't lay out their rooms like that, but the Jemez do. The Jemez and Gaina uh, share a very similar settlement structure and settlement pattern. Um, not only are they, they building these, these kind of distinct rooms with these features that outsiders would never get to see. So these, these are attributes that only somebody in the know would necessarily put in. Um, uh, and their settlement pattern is pretty close. They, they both like high elevation areas it, and so on. Now, obviously, are these mutually exclusive theories? Absolutely not. Most people uh, would say that there is, there is strong evidence that the Jemez, that both of these hypotheses are correct. Uh, that there's a sizable population moving out from the northern Rio Grande further west that the Gaina are pushing into the east and that the, the, the confluence of those two peoples, those Gaina peoples and those Rio Grande peoples is what makes the Jemez the Jemez. So they're not one or the other, they're both. Uh, and that, that's true, that, that, that is ethnogenesis or culture, a new culture being created uh, just easily. If they were just Gaina, they would probably share all Gaina traits if they were just Rio Grande, they'd look just like Rio Grande people, but no, they actually look like a combination of both. So what do the Jemez say about their own uh, arrival in the Jemez Mountains? 
Um, so I'm going to use the version as written by Sando here, uh, Joe Sando. Um, there, there, there's, there's slight variations on this, to, depending upon who you ask in the village of Wallatoa today. Um, but in, 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 in the Jemez creation story, they emerge from a lake known as Hosejela, or Stone Lake, located somewhere in the, the Four Corners. They live in the Four Corners for a time, but eventually migrate south and east. Um, during this migration path, uh, a vision is relayed to the Jemez that says they should stop and settle where they see the, the great eagle. And the Jemez are, are going around, you know, they're moving south and east, and then they end up going south. And on the south face of Redondo Peak, which is the picture you can see above you, they saw the sign of the eagle, and they, hence they chose to settle along the southern Jemez Mountains. And in fact, if you look at their seal today, which I've provided down below, you'll notice that the sign of the eagle is featured prominently on the mountainside. And it's, it's many of the reasons why, you know, you know, Redondo Peak and why the Valles Caldera is such a, a sacred and important place for the Hamas people today and why, why they have such an interest in, in this place being preserved, and protected, and potentially going into tribal hands is because their entire reason for settling in this, this area is based upon this mountain, which um, is not part of their tribal lands today. Um, so it's, it's an area of, 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 of importance to them in, in, in many ways. And it's important to understand that it, also this, this story, uh, interestingly enough, would seem to indicate um, that, that for, argue more for the Guyana uh, migration. But there, there's been uh, Joe Sando actually in, in his handbook for the, the North American Indian actually, I think, mentioned specifically just says as a, like a defined statement. The Jemez are descendants of the Guyana, and then later on he walked that back uh, in, in later publications. And, and, and how you look at it, it's really up to you. Um, but the, the Jemez, like many peoples in, in the Rio Grande today, are both a Four Corners people and a Rio Grande people. It's probably the best way to look at it. Um, so by the classic period, we're, we're talking 80, 1300 to 1600, this would be your, your uh, part of your Jemez phase or your Jemez period in the Jemez province. Uh, the center of the Anasazi world shifts from the Four Corners to the northern Rio Grande. Aggregation of Pueblo peoples in, into very large villages and increased population with many different ethnic groups living in close proximity to one another. Uh, here is a, a kind of a distribution of Pueblo language groups today. Language isn't always a, 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 uh, the only indicator of different cultures, but it, it, language is usually like one of the first things we look at. In fact, um, linguistically, it, it's easier to separate people based on linguistics than, than necessarily other cultural traits a lot of the times. And the, and the major linguistic groups you have in our, our area, of course, are the, uh, other than for the Navajo and Apache, which are not uh, Pueblo peoples per se, is the Parisian languages. Um, and you can see those, those located in, in uh, red on the map. Uh, you have the Tewa languages, which are in yellow. You have the uh, Tiwa languages, which are in green, and you'll see that there's a there's a split. In fact, you know, if you're you're talking about migration patterns, one of the things they say is, well, if you looked at those two earlier migration patterns, you know, the, the Chaco and the the Mesa Verde, many people have argued this, and I it's, it's beyond the scope of this lecture. But for example, if you notice that the Kirizan languages appear to be like they're shooting out from Chaco Canyon, like if you were to draw an arrow from arrows from Chaco Canyon going east, those would be all the places they would hit. And then if you did a, a, a circle at Mesa Verde and you went towards the Rio Grande, the Tewa appear to kind of shoot in as an arrow and they split those Tewish peoples, which are, or are the traditional peoples, the traditional language spoken on the Rio Grande. And you'll notice even if that's the case, then if, if the Jemez or the Gaina they kind of migrate in kind of as the last gasp of those migration areas and they end up over there. Of course, that doesn't, it, it, it looks nicer today than it would if we put all the, uh, the uh, early Spanish colonial Pueblos on there. It get, becomes a much more complicated story. Um, but for right now, this, this works. A lot of people have justified based upon things like this map. Um, uh, the Toa language is part of the Tanoan family. This includes Kiowa. Tiwa and Tewa. Uh, Kiowa may have been the language of the Fremont. I know that sounds weird since Kiowa is out in Oklahoma today, uh, 
And if you were to ask the Kiowa where they came from, they, they say they came from the area in and around like Montana. Uh, but if the Fremont migrated north and then end, eventually moved down, which is what most people think happened, maybe the Kiowa are the language of the Fremont. Interestingly enough, if the Kiowa are not the Fremont, then the Jemez, Toa speaking peoples definitely are because they're the closest linguistically. And we know the Fremont were, were uh, pretty far removed from the later uh, Tewa and Tewa branches of, of, of linguistics. Um, uh, it was used by most, Tinoan language group was used by most, but not all Four Corners Anasazi. For example, Karis is not related to, to the Tinoan language family. Uh, and Toa was spoken historically by not only peoples of Hamas province, but also the area in and around Pecos. Um, so uh, while I'm not talking about the Pecos region today, it's important to note that, in, and while they had a very different culture in the Pecos region, that linguistically at the time of contact, the, Peco, the people at Pecos uh, spoke a Toa language and today are, are incorporated into Hamas Pueblo. Um, and it's assumed that the Toa language was, was, was possibly the earlier language of the Largo Gaina and probably Rosa, Pedra, and, and Arbolas cultures as, as well, in the, the, uh, at least to some extent in the Four Corners. Um, so what is hate as culture? Uh, well, it's culturally distinct from all other Pueblo groups. Uh, it's a, a mountain adaptation in a marginal environment focused on upland dry farming away from permanent water sources. They have a greater reliance on wild plant and animal resources. Um, they had very large settlements upon defensible positions, high atop the ridges. And you say, well, that's normal. Akama is way on top of the ridges. Sorta. The Jemez go to almost an absurd degree on that. And they're, they're the and unlike Akama who, who farmed down below the village, um, it, it the Jemez farmed right up on those mesa tops too. Um, and they had at least, there are at least, there's 40 large settlements and at least nine that had over 650 rooms. So big, big cultural center in the in Jemez province. Uh, but the majority of people on their day-to-day -day lives probably lived in a, a field house units. And we're gonna look at images of what all these things look like in a second. All throughout Jemez province. They are, um, I, I know Pueblo means village. Um, and Jemez does not mean suburb, but if, if, if it, the, the, the reality is their, their lifelike ways were, were probably closer to a suburb living than they were to a, a village living for, say, most of the year. Um, and, and possibly there was only seasonal occupation, which the villages were really largely occupied. And um, the, the big thing that's defined archaeologically with Jemez culture is the use of Jemez black on white and very limited evidence of trade wares. Uh, the most common decorated type is Hamas black on white and it appears in large, large numbers compared to all other pottery types. You can see an example, what does Hamas black on white look like? It looks like this. If, you, if you're familiar with Santa Fe black on white, you say that's not that different from Santa Fe black on white, you are absolutely correct. Remember, it's a derivative of Viacito's black on white, which is almost identical. It's just a local variation of Santa Fe black on white. So here you go, these are, these are all bowls of Hamas black on white. It's carbon-based paint, so it, it tends to look a little more washy. But the, but the really strange thing, and the thing you'll see in Jemez black on white, is they're, they're slipping this white uh, slip over the entire thing. But if you were to break these pots or look at broken pieces of the pot, the clay used to manufacture these pots is actually really, really red. In fact, one of the things I, I tend to use when I'm, I'm trying to tell people to um, – to recognize him as black on white, is that it, I, I, I use the word ghost white on a lot of the pottery. Because if you'll notice that the, the, the white slip has been applied to all of these things, but often, and, and we can't really zoom in on these, but I think you can see it in the images here. Often, even with the white slip, you can see the red clay kind of beneath it. You know, like a ghost is semi-translucent. You can kind of see that going through these pots. Uh, also, if you break the pots, they're tempered with pumice or volcanic, uh, uh, volcanic ash tuff. Um, so and they, these are materials that are easily found and acquired in the Haymans Mountains. Um, decoration uh, consists of thick line combinations of rim ticking. Um, I don't know if any of those examples really kind of demonstrate that per se, but those are beautiful examples of Haymans black on white pottery. It also looks like a, a very classic kind of pre-contact 
Pueblo style. Uh, it, most of the Rio Grande during this time period, the classic period, when, when the Jemez are still making Jemez black and white, most Pueblo peoples have shifted towards um, uh, glazewares, uh, lead, uh, lead glaze decoration. Uh, Jemez continue with a carbon paint tradition well into the time of Spanish contact. And these are great examples of, of the Jemez pottery tradition, pre-contact Jemez pottery tradition. So what does a large village look like? This, the image on the top is a, a reconstruction by Dennis Holloway of uh, Sechuca Pueblo. And I'm probably saying that wrong if you say, well, Sechuca, isn't that the stuff that Tunisian people eat with eggs and tomato sauce that's delicious? It absolutely is. So I'm probably butchering that word. That's probably not how it's really pronounced in Toa. And I'm sorry. It means eagle's nest. Or, or it, 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 and, and sometimes it's known as um, uh, San Juan Pueblo. Um, archaeologically, it's known as San Juan Pueblo because it's on top of the San Juan Mesa. It has about 1,100 rooms. In fact, you can see some little standing walls from those rooms. Uh, now, it's a picture taken about 10 years ago. I hope those walls are still standing. Um, it has about 1,100 rooms. It's on a high defensible position uh, with the plazas facing inward to, uh, onto the mesa top. There's no immediate source of water. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really big and surrounded by forest. It's uh, not necessarily what you think of when you think of uh, desert peoples of the American Southwest. Instead, it's, it's surrounded by large forested areas. Um, so that's what a big village looks like per se. So what does a little village look like? Well, this is, this is most of the time, this is I think one of the ones from my uh, master's work in you know, Virgin Mesa. And in fact, it is definitely, because this is located top Virgin Mesa and I don't know why I would use somebody else's picture for this. Uh, so you're looking at LA160899. It doesn't have a nice name. Uh, but this is what a typical Haymas field house looks like when you find it archaeologically today. It looks like a cluster of um, uh, tough stone that's just kind of scattered about. Looks kind of rectangular in shape where the walls have all collapsed in on themselves. Um, usually these things measure about 15 by 15 feet square. Uh, once again, they're not located near an immediate source of uh, water. And in fact, in some cases, the, these things are so clustered together, I, I said they're, they're kind of like suburbs. If you stand at one of these, you can almost, at, on Virgin Mesa, it, 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 some of the, the, high, the higher populated areas, such as around uh, Amajuqua on, on top of Virgin Mesa, you can stand on one of these things and throw a rock to the next house. Um, so and now all those houses didn't need to be necessarily occupied at the same time. But you, you kind of get the idea. Yeah, it's kind of like suburbs. Um, you know, they're packed in in the, the, the single units, but they're also pretty dispersed across the, the uh, landscape. Uh, dating these things is really hard. A lot of times the only pottery type found on these sites other than um, utility wares is Hamas black on white, which has that long range of time. So when you find Hamas black on white on one of these sites while you're doing like survey, the only thing you could say is, well, it dates sometime between 1300 and 1700 AD. Could date to this entire huge range of time period and is not very useful for our interpretation of the area. These are very common amongst the Hamas area. That's the most common type of archaeological site you're going to find in Hamas province today. In fact, if, you're, if you've done any hiking around in the Hamas Mountains, in the southern Hamas Mountains, you've seen these things. You might not have known what they were, but they're all over the place. Okay, so... Um, the Spanish arrive. Primarily, it's important to note that um, we, we tend to think that Coronado came first. And we get that beautiful picture of, by, I think that's Frederick Remington, uh, of Coronado crossing the desert there. But if we look at expeditions into uh, the American Southwest, um, Coronado actually fits within, within several expeditions. Of course, we have um, the Navarre's expedition in, that was in Florida that, that that failed and some of those guys made their way through the American Southwest. They may have entered into New Mexico or certainly they just passed by it in Texas if they didn't make it in per se. And certainly by 1539, we've got Esteban who'd been on that Navarra's expedition. He comes back up as part of the Niza expedition and is killed at Zuni. Uh, then we have the Coronado expedition, then later the Chamiscado Rodriguez expedition, and then after that, the Espejo expedition. Uh, it's even interesting to note that in New Mexico, we actually have a, a, a failed colony before Añate in which um, um, a Jewish conquistador came up here and started enslaving lots of people, but he didn't have a right uh, 
he'd actually been convicted of Judea, Judaizing, which is, I guess, a thing in uh, Spanish culture uh, that you could be accused of. And uh, he fled into New Mexico, started a colony, and the authorities brought him and his colonists back. So Oñate really isn't even the first colonizer. Once again, the, these narratives that get simplified sometimes through New Mexico history uh, are really part of a broader narrative. And here, I just like to point out that the Coronado narrative is part of this broader exploration narrative uh, that included many different people. The Navarrez expedition with Cabeza de Vaca and Esteban, and later the Nisa expedition with Esteban, and, and so on and so forth. Um, at the time of contact, um, Exactly how many people lived in Jemez province is uh, debated. Um, estimates ra range uh, uh, between seven and 15 active villages at the time of Coronado's expedition. And uh, those expeditions that came, uh, one of them, I think it was the Espejo, actually uh, gives uh, 30,000 as the estimate of people in the Jemez mountains. Most archeologists assume lower numbers are correct. Uh, 6,000 might be a good number for the, the time of contact, but, but certainly it, it's hard to ignore the figures that the Spanish gave uh, because most of those are, are you know, e even if we don't think they're correct, a lot of times they're, 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 they're told verbatim in, in popular histories. And, and the, the, the problem I have with not reporting that number is if you would use the Spanish estimate for the, the Tewa Basin, for example, the area around Española, then you should use the, ta the, the Spanish estimate for Jemez province too, so that you can compare those numbers. And the reason why I say that is there's more people living in the Jemez province at the time of contact than there are living in, in uh, the Tewa Basin. So even though there's a lot of Tewa Pueblos today, there was actually more people in the Jemez mountains at that time period. In, in the, the highest population estimate, which is given by Espejo in 1583, uh, really happens after the Tigre War. So after Coronado has sacked the areas in and around Albuquerque, there's a lot of people living in the Jemez Mountains. Some of those people could have fled up into the Jemez Mountains as a result of that Tigre War. Uh, and there's some evidence for that. Uh, the, the first big thing is we see an increase in glazeware pottery shirts found on 16th and 17th century sites. And we have limited tree ring data for a lot of archeological sites in the Jemez Mountains, but almost all of them suggest uh, substantial construction episodes from about 1550 to 1600, which uh, unsurprisingly kind of matches very well with that Tigre War. So populations booming in the Jemez Mountains um, at, or at the time of these explorations and at the time of colonization. Um, so Spanish colonial period, uh, the initial, the, the colony of New Mexico, uh, the official colony that we, we now live in today, uh, was established by Juan de Oñate in 1598. Um, most of Spanish settlement was concentrated between present day Socorro and Taos along the Rio Grande. Uh, Franciscan priests accompanied the settlers. Um, and while colonizers were initially interested in mineral wealth, failure to find mineral resources leads to the colony becoming a territory of secondary importance. Uh, and then the period ends with uh, Mexican succession from the Spanish Empire. Jemez province under the Spanish um, changes quite dramatically. Um, literally, Oñate arrives in New Mexico and Franciscans go out to the Jemez Mountains that year, actually. Um, Alonzo Lugo is at uh, Jemez historic site, probably. Um, he's in the Jemez Mountains by 1598. Uh, so religious figures enter the mountains uh, very quickly. There's very little secular authority present uh, amongst the Spanish in the Jemez Mountains. Uh, but we see the adoption of many um, old world domesticates, primarily sheep, goat, horse, cow, and chicken. And, and the, the, probably the most important one there is sheep and goat. Uh, sheep and goat are really hard to tell apart in the archaeological record, and they're used for a lot of the same things. and can live in the exact same environment. They're, they're both good animals to have in the highlands of New Mexico. Um, so which one was it, sheep or goat? We don't, we don't know, but it, it could have been either or or both. Um, either or both. Um, we also see the appearance of, of, of European trade goods, such as beads, glass beads, were a very popular trade item, myolica pottery, and metal tools. Uh, we also see an increased reliance amongst the Jemez people on agriculture and a diversifying of agricultural products during this time. There are at least uh, 
five missions, Hamez missions built uh, during the Hamez phase, uh, that, that early Spanish colonial period. Uh, the first was Lugo's mission, which was probably at Hamez historic site. Um, and we have evidence of it at Hamez historic site that we believe is Lugo's church, but we don't know that for sure. And of course, the bigger one, the one you see in the picture there, the one uh, we protect and preserve today, is San Jose de los Jemez, um, or San Jose Pueblo, or Mission. Uh, that's the, the, the big one, and it went from about 1621 to 1639, maybe up to 1680. There's San Diego de la Congregación, which went from about 1626 or 1628. Um, that's after the Jemez Revolt of 1623. Uh, that may have been, that San Diego mission uh, may have been at Wallatoa. In fact, uh, Matthew Liebman may have found archaeological, uh, at Harvard University may have found archaeological evidence of that mission. Uh, there's also San Diego del Monte, which was at uh, Patoqua, uh, potentially. Uh, and you can still go there and see the, the, the ruins of that mission, kind of at the foot of uh, Guadalupe Mesa. And then lastly, San Juan de los Jemez. Uh, which may have been at, I think, Bolotokwa. I don't know of anyone who's found any solid archaeological evidence of San Juan de los Jemez. It, I, 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 I could be speaking out of line here. It's been a long time since I've given this lecture, and I don't know of the proposed location right now of San Juan uh, mission in, the, in Jemez province. Jemez resistance. Um, so you get these missions here. Uh, that sounds great, right? Well, if you notice, most of these missions don't have long lives to them, or they seem to kind of come and go. Um, well, there's there might have been an upheaval in Jemez province in 1601. We don't know why Lugo left, uh, but we know he left by 1601. So there may have been an upheaval that caused that. Uh, there's certainly the Jemez Revolt or Civil Jemez Civil War, depending upon whether you Spanish or uh, Spanish, how you interpret Spanish accounts. It certainly went from 1623 to 1626. That's when the, the mission at Jemez Historic Site was burned for the first time, maybe the only time. Um, that's also uh, looks like the time period in which the room we excavated uh, several years ago at Jemez Historic Site may have burned. Uh, there was a Jemez and Apache insurrection on top of Virgin Mesa uh, going from about 1644 to 1647. Uh, sometime in that area. Uh, there was a Pueblo Revolt of 1680, and of course the Pueblo Revolt of 1696. All of these, the, the Jemez participated. There's actually probably a lot more than these. Uh, Spanish documents were not keen to report in, indigenous uprisings in general, especially if they were, they were put down or, or caught in the uh, initial phases. Uh, collapse during the Jemez phase uh, came during um, the Reconquest. Um, the, the most famous battle is, of course, the Battle of Osteolaqua, fought on July 24th, 1694. Uh, during this battle, and you, you can see pictures of Osteolaqua here below, uh, the Jemez had retreated on top of Guadalupe Mesa, where they fought um, uh, Governor de Vargas, along with a contingent of uh, Zia auxiliaries, uh, attacked the Mesa top, uh, managed to, to break um, Jemez resistance and, and forced peace during the so-called Spanish bloodless reconquest. Um, in fact, there's a story that goes, if you look at Guadalupe Mesa today, which is that first big mesa you, you come upon as you, you're going along Highway 4, many of the warriors, rather than uh, uh, admit defeat or, 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 or surrender to Spanish forces, actually jumped off the mesa tops. And uh, according to local legend, um, Guadalupe or, or San Diego, depending, depending on how, who's telling the story, uh, actually caught these warriors and allowed them to, to get to the uh, ground safely. It's a great story. It's probably not true. They probably committed suicide rather than submit to Spanish uh, rule. And, and, and that isn't the end of the story, but eventually after the failed revolt in 1696 and a large punitive campaign, the Jemez are forced to resettle along the Jemez River at Wallatoa. They're actually removed from most of Jemez province and moved further south in, in, into uh, the lower Jemez Valley. And, 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 and if we look at this in terms of historic accounts, so what the Spanish gave for numbers of Jemez people, 
1583, Espejo said there were 30,000 Jemez people living in Jemez province. In 1704, the Spanish authorities reported there were only 300 Jemez people living in Jemez province. So within the course of roughly 100 years, a little more than 100 years, Spanish estimates, remember, which might be exaggerated, both of these numbers could be exaggerated, both the 30,000 and 300 could be exaggerated. We've lost 99% uh, of the population. It's food for thought. Oh, so what are the reasons for this decline? Uh, well, the big one isn't warfare. It's actually disease. Um, uh, infectious diseases, uh, they don't show up very good in the archaeological record, but we know that certainly by the time that the Jemez people are living in contact with the Franciscan missionaries, they are catching diseases and they're passing them on to their their neighbors and loved ones and population is declining. The second biggest factor is also not warfare, it's migration. And in fact, during this time period, what we see in the, the Dinatah, so those Four Corners areas, remember I said the Jemez were probably descendants of a Four Corners population. Well, many of the Jemez probably decided not to live amongst the Spanish and went home to the Four Corners. Is what we see in the Four Corners during this time period of the, this Jemez decline is a emergence of these things known as pueblitos and a people known that we would know today as the Navajo or living in these pueblitos. These pueblitos, the most common non-locally produced pottery type is Jemez black on white. And in fact, amongst the Navajo, we have many stories of many Pueblo peoples joining the Navajo out in the four corners. In fact, uh, the entire coyote clan of, of the Navajo is thought to be of Jemez descent. It's probably a Jemez village, lock, stock, and barrel, one of those big villages, we don't know which one, just moving up to the four corners. They just leave. And of course, the last one is warfare. Many, many deaths were attributed to warfare, but it's important to note that disease and, and migration played a large role. So what were some of the diseases? Um, there, there's a lot of different um, choices for what could have killed the Jemez people. These are some of the ones my professor, uh, Dr. Ann Romanovsky, the person who inspired a lot of my research later in time, uh, kind of gave as, as possible uh, new world diseases that were likely the cause of the decline of Native American populations throughout the new world. Um, and you could see those here. We got smallpox, measles, yellow fever, chickenpox, influenza, and cold, anthrax, whooping cough, typhus, uh, your bacteria, and then you got parasites. You have uh, malaria. And uh, I can't even say that last word, schizosomes. I, I know there's many of you that have a healthcare background. You probably can give better interpretations of those names there, but, but a lot of nasty things going around that were definitely impacting the, the Jemez people and other indigenous groups. So the migration thing, here's a beautiful uh, Pueblitos in the Dinata. Uh These little Pueblos um, are often have Jemez black and white, and they all show up right around the same time the Jemez are leaving. And, and a lot of the table people are, are, are going. And interestingly enough, they're all located in the area uh, of Rosa culture. So the very earliest place where we have the, the emergence of, of Diana culture, these, these things with their Jemez black on white pottery show right up where, where we think the Jemez people originally came from anyways. So it's kind of a return home for a lot of people potentially. But we're talking about Jemez province. So when we're talking about warfare, uh, we got lots of battles. Um, most are probably not well documented, uh, but we have several key battles and we do have numbers for them. Um, the Jemez resisted a lot. In fact, this picture here is not of Jemez. Uh, it's just one of the most interesting pictures of a Spanish first Pueblo battle I have ever seen. Um, and in fact, it was done by a, a Dutch painter. And it's if you can imagine, that is a, a Pueblo village on that bluff there as as imparted upon a Dutch painter. And that is actually the Zuni village of Hawaku. It's so strange to me. It looks nothing like New Mexico, but that's what a Dutch person envisioned uh, as he lived within the Spanish empire and he was told of the, 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 the Coronado expedition. That's what he came up with in his brain. Um, any rate, some key battles we do have uh, uh, death totals for Jemez people. Um, we have that, that of course, that, that, that battle on July 24th, that battle of Ostia we have 84 Jemez reported killed in that engagement. Um, on June 4th, during the, 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 uh, the Pueblo Revolt of, of 1696, 
Uh, we at June 4th, we have 32 Jemez killed while they're attacking uh, Zia Pueblo. And then June 29th, a little bit later, we have uh, 40 Jemez killed. Now, it's interesting to note that at 1696, all these numbers in 1694, 1696, 1696, these are all really late numbers. Remember, in 1704, they only report there's only seven, uh, 300 Jemez people. So 84 people. So say the population was about 400 in 1694, probably a little larger than that. Say it was 500. That means tw on, on July 24th, almost 20% of your population died on that single day. Another 10% of your population, you know, potentially 10% of your population died on June 4th of 69. You know, by then you're probably pretty close to 300. You know, you lose 10% of your population, you know, 75% of your population. Those are huge numbers. Can you imagine losing 5% of the American population today in a single battle? So even though these numbers don't appear large to the naked eye, if you really look at what those – those, those Spanish estimates are by the end of this time period. Those are large numbers of deaths. Um, they're very late in the sequence, but, but very large numbers of deaths. Okay, a couple more slides. I'm gonna go real fast because I'm almost out of time. By 1706, populations concentrated at Wallaco. That's current day Jemez Pueblo. The area north of Jemez province is, is, is abandoned. Um, it's, it's forcibly abandoned. The Jemez people don't abandon it willingly. They're, they're forced to abandon it by Spanish authorities. And Navajo forays begin in the region, raids into the area. Uh, Mexican period, uh, really interesting period of New Mexico history. It lasts from 1821 to 1846. Um, it's the time period in which the Santa Fe Trail opened. It was really a very progressive time. In fact, the Mexican government was very, very progressive. It had some great ideas, had no money to implement anything. In fact, the coolest thing you could do is you can look at Santa Fe laws, and the Santa Fe laws are so much better and more progressive under the Mexican government but United States authority in Santa Fe was so much stronger and controlling that it, it, even though they did less, it appears like they did more, even though their laws were actually uh, less, um, less stringent. Um, and, and, and during this time period, really nomadic Indian raids into Hispanic and Pueblo settlements really increase. It, and the perfect example is this. So the, 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 the Spanish moved the Jemez people out of most of Jemez province by 1706, they established the, the, the eventually established the San Diego land grant officially in 1798, includes all the lands north of Wallatoa and the Valles Caldera. And by 1821, there's 864 settlers, Hispanic settlers living in the Jemez Valley. But by 1849, there's nobody left. So within the, the short period of time in which the Mexican government had, had ruled New Mexico, the area had been completely abandoned due to Navajo raids. Um, which is gonna lead us into the territorial period really quickly. Territorial period, you go, well, what does this have to do? Well, hey man, people are still around today. They're still going and this is part of the story. Uh, but the United States territorial period is a pretty fascinating time in, in history. It's often viewed as, as a transition uh, culturally um, along many different lines. Uh, from Hispanic to Anglo, but of course that that's kind of a false narrative since Hispanic people are still the majority in New Mexico today and, and certainly have a very strong tradition. Hispanic peoples, the, the traditional Spanish culture of Hispanic New Mexico changes to a more Anglified culture, which they, they still have today in many ways. You go from a barter economy during the territorial period to a money economy. You go from cottage production, uh, cottage production or, or household production uh, to in industry with trains. This is the Mexico Central Railway that I worked on. Um, you, you see uh, a, a transition from a local economy to a national economy, uh, trails to railways. And, and, and the, the strangest one for most people is Democrat to Republican. It went from a, uh, initially during the American territorial period, we have a very conservative regime in New Mexico. Uh, that is a, a Democrat at that point meant very conservative, whereas Republican meant very progressive. And during the territory period, we go from a very conservative regime to a very, by the end, a very progressive regime uh, led by the, the Republicans in New Mexico. Um, uh, dur mo during most of the time period, there was direct or indirect military control over most of the territory and there's frequent conflicts with Native American tribes. Um, the Jemez uh, were uh, one of the allies of the United States government during most of this period. 
Um, U.S. Army enters Jemez province in 1849 on the way to fight uh, the Navajo. Um, a friendship develops. Uh, the U.S. Army is actually invited down into the Jemez Kivas. They take them up for a tour of Jemez historic site. I wish I was making all this stuff up. We actually have U.S. journals to talk about this stuff. And then they fight several important, the Jemez in, in, in U.S. Army fight several uh, important battles. Uh, the most famous battle is probably the Battle of Red Rocks in 1863. That's my name for it. Uh, it involves uh, Navajo raiding Tezuke Pueblo uh, and the U.S. Army tracking the Navajo down. Uh, two, they get to Red Rocks and they ask the Jemez people what happened to the Navajo. They had stolen a whole bunch of sheep and goats uh, from Tezuke and the Jemez informed them that, yes, the Navajo had been crossing through their territory and they had been dispatched, killed and captured a lot of the Navajo. It's not really clear if they, they gave the, the sheep and goats back to the Tezuke Pueblo. And in fact, for a short period of time in 1863, the U.S. Army actually has a camp, a military post up in the Valles Caldera, uh, the Valles Grande. Uh, and eventually, um, Jemez and the U.S. Army working together, uh, work on forcing the Navajo to resettle at Bosque Indian Reservation in 1864. Jemez actually contributed quite a bit, not only in terms of provisions, uh, but in scouts and, 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 and warriors to the, the war effort against the Navajo. And while this is a horrible atrocity for the Navajo, it was a great victory for the Jemez, who at that point viewed uh, many Navajos there, uh, even though they did themselves, many of the Navajo were probably likely uh, Jemez people that had fled the area. They viewed themselves as, as rivals at this point, competitors uh, for a lot of the same resources and area. And that's not, uh, nothing against the Jemez people or the Navajo people for pursuing those those aggressions against one another. I, I, it's completely understandable. Um, the New Mexico statehood period, get the first atomic bomb. Boom, there it is, right? The Trinity explosion. Um, New Mexico is added as the 47th uh, state. You know, certainly that all has to do with the Jemez Mountains too, uh, including research just east of Jemez province in, in the Pajarito at Los Alamos. And, and you know, we have several uh, military bases and laboratories in the area today, including Los Alamos. Uh, during the, the, the early statehood period, uh, Jemez province goes through one more transformation, uh, which is the green gold rush. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna end the talk for today. But during the 20th century, the San Diego land grant was targeting uh, coal and sulfur. There really isn't any in the Jemez mountains. So there's a little bit of sulfur, but it, it's not profitable. Uh, the big thing was the green gold rush. Uh, it's pretty much one company that goes by different names. It was first known as the Portland Lumber Company, then the White Pine Lumber Company, and the New Mexico Lumber Company. Pretty much all the old timber, the old ponderosa pines that had been living, had been in the Jemez Mountains for years, are all removable. Um, the, the, the nature of the forest in the Jemez Mountains completely changes as a result of this, this lumber industry, but it brings a lot of money into the area. It's very important for the development of Bernalillo as a town, but also for the peoples of Gilman, the peoples of Jemez Springs, or, or what's going to become Jemez Springs, and, and so on and so forth. Jemez Province today. Uh, most land in Jemez Province is owned by the federal government. Uh, some of it's owned by state and tribal agencies as well, uh, but most of it's federally owned land. Uh, much of Jemez Province is set aside for public recreation, uh, but the Jemez people are, are flourishing. You know, in, in 1706, there were less than 300 Jemez people left, according to Spanish accounts. There are over 3,500 inhabitants of Wallatoa today. And the Jemez have been very interested in reclaiming the province and the areas of their, their ancestral peoples. Uh, whether that's done in, consult, you know, gaining more uh, consultation and rights to use the land, or if it's actually managing the land directly, the, these are all things that are still being sorted out today. But the Jemez people are on a rise, and the, the, the federal lands are open for visitors to come and see. In fact, come and see us at Jemez Historic Site when we're reopened uh, from COVID. All right, with that, I will stop sharing and answer questions. Well, one was when you were talking about um, as the Jemez people arrived and the Guyana people abandoned the area, and the Guyana people had a history of warfare or violence, was there uh, any evidence of violence between the Jemez as they entered and the Guyana people as they um, moved on? Or were they... So, so so the Guyana move into the Jemez Mountains and probably become the Jemez people, right? 
So what I think happened is that the Gaeta move into the, the Hamas Valley and into the Hamas Mountains, into the southern part of what we call Hamas province today, uh -huh. and they intermix with the local Tiwa-speaking peoples that are migrating up along the Hamas River. Is there any violence between the two groups? No. Uh, the Tiwa were probably not very numerous in the region to begin with. Um, there is no evidence that I'm aware of that suggests the Gaeta moving into the southern Hamas province practice violence, but we're not, people still debate whether it's the Gaina that actually move in. Uh -huh. The early Pueblo, some of the early Pueblos are actually on Hamas tribal land today, uh, such as the, the Viacitos Pueblo. And if you go out to Viacitos Pueblo today, it's very small, relatively speaking. It, it may not have been a large population initially that migrated in. Uh, but no, there isn't any evidence. And it's also important to note that while Guyana is viewed as a very violent society, I think a lot of that, that uh, as I matured as an archaeologist and as a historian and started to look at the bigger picture, I think a lot of that reputation is unwarranted. Because at the time period in which they're violent, there's violence going on throughout the American Southwest. It's a very time of drought. You go to the Four Corners region, Things are really, really bad in the Four Corners region. So just the fact that, yes, the Guyana, uh, there, there's, there's some pretty uh, gnarly accounts out there in the archaeological record of, of people witnessing pretty horrific things. Uh, but certainly the Guyana were not the only people that, 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 that had violence. And, and so I, I just, I don't think the Guyana came in as conquerors. I think they came in as colonists, as settlers. In, into the Hamas province that they came in. They came in to farm. They came in to maintain their ways of life as best they could. And of course, in, in living with these, these new Rio Grande speaking peoples, they became, all of them became the Hamas we know today. And um, the Hamas though are still very, uh, we didn't really talk about this. The Hamas are pretty war, are considered fairly warlike amongst uh, Pueblo peoples. So if anything, if you're gonna say the Guyana are warlike, then yes, the Hamas continued on that warrior tradition. They had a very proud warrior tradition going into Spanish contact and certainly resisted the Spanish often. That was another one of my questions. I mean, did they have a warrior tradition? Because when you listed the resistance to Span the Spaniards, I mean, there were several, several iterations of that. And yeah, so the Hamas are known, uh, both Toa speaking peoples. So both peoples that we think, if the Guyana were speaking Toa, both Pecos and Jemez were the areas with very warrior, were very large warlike traditions at the time of Spanish contact. In fact, the Spanish comment on it. So the people speaking Toa appear to be much more interested in warfare in general. That being said, it seems very likely based upon the archeological and archival record that the Jemez spent most of their time warring amongst themselves. So Jemez villages attacking Jemez villages, not necessarily the Jemez forming a confederation and attacking outside groups at this time period. So that, that's kind of an important thing to note. Uh, also, many other Pueblo traditions, so there are certain Tewa Pueblos that had very large and important warrior-like traditions. Uh, certain Karis Pueblos were, were known for their warriors, even a, a Tewish Pueblo, all, all Pueblo peoples had a, a very substantial and very important warrior tradition coming into uh, Spanish contact. Well, this is Trish. <clears throat> what, what, with all those Spanish expeditions that, that came during that one century, we don't hear much about the evidence of those Spanish expeditions. Did they just pick up all our stuff and take it home, or they must be? No, no so that that's actually a so that that that's a realistic way. Why do they spend so much time looking for the Coronado expedition? Because the Coronado expedition, in terms of number of people, was like this, and I'm filling my whole hands up the screen. The other expeditions were a handful of people. They were like oh. this. Oh, okay. So archaeologically, it's hard to find. When you're only talking a handful of people or a, 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 a relatively small party, it's hard to see it in the archaeological record. Um, they don't leave a lot of stuff behind. Coronado brought an army with him. He, so we, we te it, it was grand. It was on a scale that, that was really ridiculous. I mean, um, so that's the reason why we focus on that as far as archaeologically. You're not going to find much evidence of those other expeditions. Um, Matt, Cheryl was wondering about the uh, Hamas and the Apache conflicts. Okay. So th there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things there. In fact, um, 
the so the the, the Navajo and Jemez did traditionally fight with each other later on. But there's also plenty of accounts, and I've joked about this with both Navajo and Jemez people, that there's a couple accounts in the Spanish archives where the Hame, the, the the priests claim that troublesome Navajo living amongst the Jemez caused these problems, or the Navajo did this, the Navajo did. And a lot of times I think they, the Navajo were the absolute scapegoats. Anything terrible that happened in the province, you didn't want to say your own people did it. So you pointed to your neighbors and said they were the ones who did this terrible thing. And I think that went on into many different time periods. That the Navajo have traditionally been used as scapegoats for all sorts of people behaving badly. Um, so I, I just want to put that out there. And certainly I have family members, you know, I have marriages in my family to Navajo people. So uh, certainly, when I talk about Navajo, I'm probably a bit biased that the Navajo get a bad rap. Uh, I, that being said, um, the, the Jemez have traditionally fought the Navajo and it had a very long, complex history. Uh, uh, obviously, archaeologically, there's strong evidence to suggest that many, na many of the so-called Apache peoples that are Navajo were probably Jemez peoples that, that migrated and eventually took on Navajo culture. Um, and that goes for many Pueblo peoples. There's also uh, Tewa groups that, that, that inter, intermixed with the, um, the the Navajo as well. And of course, Tewa also mixed with the Hopi. Interestingly enough, the Hamas didn't go up and join the Hopi. That was not one of their traditional lands. And I think they only migrated back to those areas they traditionally had uh, knowledge of. Just like, I don't think the Guyana area, even though they say, well, the Guyana area is abandoned by this time. I think Hamas people were definitely up in that region. In fact, the more we look, even though we, we, we tend to subscribe, and I, I've talked about this a little bit before, we tend to take people and put them into these little like bubbles. And we draw the bubbles next to each other. And we pretend like those bubbles, they come into contact with each other, but they don't overlap a lot. Uh, they did. They totally overlapped a lot. So there's areas that the Tewa use that the Hamas probably used. It, 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 so uh, there are certain areas where people go, well, there's very little evidence outside of the, uh, the, the areas just south of Redondo Peak for – for Jemez occupation. Well, yeah, there's very little evidence of Jemez farming any other areas in, in, in the bias there. But certainly Jemez people were up there and certainly they shared those areas probably with other Native American groups, not only through trade and contact, also intermarriage. And then also there are probably areas in which both groups use them either during different seasons or during the same seasons. Um, it, and, and so there's a lot of overlap is I guess what I would say. Um, yeah, the Navajo, it's, it's, it's a fascinating and sad story for the, the Navajo. Um, the, the Navajo were both the, the, the victors of the 18th century with their conflicts with the Spanish, but then also, uh, unfortunately, the, the targets of U.S. Army aggression during the, the, the primary targets of U.S. Army aggression during the 19th century as a result. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.